My wife, Ruth, sends her hellos, her best. As I walk out the door, she always tells me, remember, Dick, less is more. <laughs> so there, I'm just here to bring you hope. That's all I got. I love this theme. Uh, the, the theme of flourishing, such a big word, in, at least with the younger people today, it's a big word, but it's a, it's a great idea. And we have Psalm 92. This is the basis for it. I just want to read those verses with you. Would you read these words out loud with me as the basis for this whole series? Here we go. Psalm 92, 12 and 13. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They'll grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. The next verses. They will still bear fruit in old age. Let's just pause right there a moment. That's, no. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Flourishing is a great word. The experience is even better, okay? And uh, what a timely metaphor. Here we live in, a, in an area, in a town, that I think this is correct, has more flowering trees than any other city in the United States. And in just a few weeks, as we get into spring, we got those cherry trees, thousands of cherry. So as you're walking around these next few weeks and the flowers start to bloom, you're thinking of this. What does it mean to flourish like a tree? You've got images every time you turn around. So we're talking about flourishing as health. Relational health, which was so beautifully described last week by Pastor Nina and all the wonderful stories of community and connection. I love that. You got fit, excuse me, physical health, mental health, vocational health. All these things are being spoken to. Today, we're talking about emotional health. Now, my prayer has been this, that this message might solve something in someone's heart. That, that would be grand. If just a piece of this would solve something in somebody's heart. But at the very least, I've prayed that this message would be a seeding, a planting, if you will, good metaphor, for conversations of discovery about ourselves and about God. When we read scriptures, we learn about God. When we walk with people who have walked with him, we learn about God. But a lot of times, we don't learn about us as much. We feel us, but we don't. So here's what we know is this, to begin with is that all the arenas that I just described are connected. Physical, emotional, mental, so forth, they're connected. So I'm 38 years old, back in the day, and I'm president of this small, <laughs> way back in the day, <clears throat> and I'm president of this small college in California. I'm feeling some stress. I, I think maybe it's a heart problem or something. I go, they check me out, they charge me $106 back in the day. That's a bunch of money. And they said, your problem is that you're under stress. I, I said, I knew that. I, I didn't have to pay you $100 tell me that. But my doctor was a wonderful, if you think in categories, he was a Catholic charismatic doctor. I'll call him Dr. Cassini. And he'd walk in and he said, every time I walked in, he sat me down, took a piece of paper and said, have I drawn this for you before? And he drew this sketch, right? He said, you have a body. God made you with a body. He made you with a spirit. And he made you with emotions and a will. Right? And they're all connected. And he said, this is how disease works. And so you have ease here. And you have dis-ease here. All right? And so this is how sickness occurs. You can get a bacteria, a viral infection. You can have an injury. And your body gets whacked. And it'll affect your emotions. And it could affect your spirit over time. Or you can have an emotional trauma, or you have a loss or a tragedy, and it can affect your body, and it can affect your spirit. Or you can cross a line or miss the mark. We call it sin. You can do something that you're not designed for in God's economy, and it'll bleed out the other way and affect your emotions. You could get depressed and affect your body. So all these things are connected. Even though we have standalone messages to describe them, they're all connected. So here's the key question. What am I, what are you created for? What are we created for? There are a bunch of theologians and people who got together hundreds of years ago in a place called Westminster in England, and they, just, they had over a thousand sessions of talking about what are we created for, among other things. 
And if you come from Presbyterian roots or reform, what they call Reformed Church roots, you might have learned this. It's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And the opening line is this. The chief purpose for which man is made is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's the place that we start, walk through, and end. That's the point, okay? So how do we unpack that, if I can use that phrase? Well, we each one are God's unique creation. We've heard that hundreds of times in this space, in this congregation. We each one are God's unique creation. You're the only one of you among eight billion people on the planet. Nobody else has your story. You've heard me talk about story. I love talking about your story because it's the one you have. Nobody else has that. And it's the place in your, one place in your life you don't have to compete. You have an A before you start. You have an A third of the way through. Halfway through, still got an A. You get done, you walk away with an A. No place in my life to get an A, except when it's my unique story that I've experienced, have been created for. So there, here are some lyrics to an ancient song. It's a poet's view of how we're created. It's Psalm 139. My doctor friend, Dr. Homburg, back in Fort Collins, calls it the biochemist psalm. Listen to how it reads. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just certain verses. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. When I was a 13-year-old sitting in church, you know, I grew up in a revivalistic background where you went to church all the time. I mean, I, you know, you, and you, you draw pictures on the back of what used to be offering envelopes, and you're trying to do it. <laughs> And you're, and you're checking out girls across the aisle. And, you're, you know, it's stuff you do when you're 13 and, and, uh, and other times. But, I mean, that, that, that's what... <laughs> and, and the preacher would say, God knows what you're thinking. i go, whoa. And it, <laughs> it was too late. And I'm still here. Okay. There is great comfort in knowing that God knows me. To be known as one of the deepest pieces of our personalities. To be known by God, to be known by others, and here's the key, and still wanted. That's the power, okay? For you created, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I love this part. Why don't you say this part with me? I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I'm, I'm up here, and I can't see in the back because of the bright lights, but I'm looking at people, and I'm saying, that person is a wonderful work of God. When he says, your works are wonderful, he's talking about him. He's, he's saying, that's me. Or if you're an English major, it is I. You know, whatever it is. That, he's talking about me. And then he gets into this part. You talk about emotion. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Ever feel that emotion? Yeah. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When you read this psalm, you feel it. Okay? It's got awe. It's got wonder. It has contrition. It has dreaming. This grand story of God and mankind has emotion right, left, and center. What, here's my question, what would life be without emotion? I would submit it would be like the dark side of the moon. It would be a barren landscape where nothing grows. And so here's the God who in his grace, for better or for worse in our moments, has filled us with emotion. I mean, just think about this season. We're coming into what traditionally in the church calendar is called the Lenten season. It's the six weeks running up to Easter, right? Running up to the resurrection day. And we get to that last week, and theologians or scholars historically has called that the Passion Week. Well, it like, sounds like an emotional time. Well, it was. I mean, you think of Jesus weeping at the death of Lazarus for whatever reasons. You think of him looking over Jerusalem and saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have killed, who have killed the prophet. How I want to draw you like a hen draws her chicks to her. And then he walks in and he's confronted by all these people who are challenging him. And he walks into the temple where it's supposed to be a place of prayer, like on Thursday nights here. And they're doing business, as they say in Texas. They're, they are money changers ripping off 
people who are devoted to Yahweh, wanting to do the right thing. And Jesus walks in and starts knocking over temples. And you can hear the sound of animals and doves and flapping around. And you hear coins rolling across the floor. This isn't baby Jesus, meek and mild. This is Jesus on a, on a mission. And he says, you are not going to prostitute my father's name. You are not going to do that, right? And then emotionally, he's prostrated in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then you get to the cross. And because of the loss of connection for which we are made, i.e. last week, relational, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everybody else has run off pretty much, but why have you forsaken me? His humanity is real. I mean, you go back to his birth and here you are at Bethlehem and you hear the cries of Mary, his mother, in labor and delivery. You know, that's an emotional time. And then you hear the cry of the child. I mean, they just had this scary journey going from someplace they knew to someplace they have no idea, and they're giants in the land, and they're talking funny languages, and you say, don't hit me, I'll cry, you know, and you've got this whole thing going on, the baby's wail, and then you have tears of joy, and you have laughter. You can hear Joseph saying, look, look at that boy. What a boy. What a good thing, right? God come flesh, almighty God in human shape. So, here's a question. Where do emotions live? Well, if you, in science, the emotions live in the cortex of the brain. They're in, in this, you know, my world is this five and a half inches between my ears. That's my whole world, really. How I see things, how I think about things, the fact that I can do this is 400 separate chemical reactions to my hand and back, just like that. I can pick this up and say, how you doing out there? What's happening? What's going on? I can wave this arm. I can stroke what used to be my hair. I can do all that, all that kind of stuff, right? It's amazing, this thing that's in our, in our head. And, you know, and Pastor Mark is so good talking about the brain, and he uses words like prefrontal cortex and amygdala and hypothalamus. All those places have emotion, don't they? I mean, they do, right? And, and when you're a teenager, what we call a teenager from 13 and 19, that's still forming in there. And we're all over. The, I can remember being a teenager. And one morning, I'm, I'm going to run the world. And the next morning, or even an hour later, the world's sitting on my head. It's just bam, 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 like this, right? Emotions in the simplest form, this is both, are simply our body's reactions to what we are thinking my perspection, perspective or perception of the world triggers feelings in me, okay? It could be my belief system. It could be my other unconscious thoughts. But my body, my brain is on autopilot all the time, and I can react to something from way back that's subconscious, that's buried back there. That's why sometimes we have no idea why we feel the way we do. You, you understand that, right? You, you get that. You say, why? Where did that come from? You know, it just, it came from somewhere. Well, anyway, sometimes we just let it out. <clears throat> we have these 12 grandchildren. The eldest one is now 32 with three children of her own. So we have 12 all the way down to eight. But when the oldest ones, at least this is the family story, her parents were with her. I think it was in a hotel lobby someplace. She was three and she threw a tantrum. How many of you know about tantrums? <laughs> like you had kids who did that or... How many have done that yourself, if, you're, if you wish to? And when you're older, you don't throw them like on the floor, but you're throwing them, right? And she just threw a tantrum on the floor, screaming and squalling, and parents are going. And, you know, sometimes psychologists say, well, they're just trying to get attention, just don't pay attention to them. Well, everybody else in the room is paying attention to them, and you're trying not. But anyway, she did that for a couple of minutes, and then she stood up, brushed off her dress, and said, me better now. <laughs> you know, I think in some of these stores that we go to, whether it's the Walmarts or the Targets or whatever the store where you're shopping for stuff, and it's so frustrating because you have three kids and they're hiding under the clothes racks and you're trying to find them and you, you just need a room in the changing room. Maybe instead of they have two or three changing rooms, you go and they just have one room that's just padded where you just walk in there and you scream and shout and pad, you walk out and say, me better now, let me find the kids, you know, whatever. I just made that up, but I'm just saying. But, but when you're adults, what do you do with those emotions? So I'm president of this small college and we have a situation where someone for cause needs to be let go from staff, faculty. 
And I knew I had to do it. But man, I was struggling emotionally to do it. A friend of mine said, you know, I have a friend who's an organizational psychologist. Let's have lunch. And we sat down. He came over from San Jose. We were in Santa Cruz by Monterey Bay on the coast. He sat down and he started talking about it. He said, how do you describe the, the faculty staff, the, the, the people who staff the college? I said, well, we call them the Bethany family. He said, tell me about yours. So I told him about mine, and he said, any, any trauma in the family? I said, well, after 29 years of marriage and a dad who was a pastor and missionary, I'm just married, four months married, and I get a letter when I'm a week in college grad school, and my dad says he's leaving. I said, how did you feel about that? Well, I told him how I felt about that. I was ticked. I was frustrated. I, I, was, I didn't know how to handle it. It was my identity. It was going out the door in some way, and I was just moving into what we call ministry, right? And he said, I think the challenge is that you've been part of a family breakup once you had nothing to do with and couldn't stop, and you don't want to be part of another one. But if you don't do this, it will cripple the entire institution. And I went back, and I did it. And the person didn't like it, but a few years later, that person came back and said, you did exactly the right thing. But the, but the trauma that we go through of those kinds of things. So what I do know is how I think about something is determinative of how I feel about the moments and circumstances. Here's the equation. Thought plus feeling equals action. Thought plus feeling equals action. I mean, think about the Garden of Eden. You know that story back in Genesis 3 where here is God who creates this whole garden. We don't know how large it was or how big it was, but all kinds of flowering and fruit trees and all of this. We're back to trees. And he says to Adam and Eve, it's all yours. I just want you to take care of it, work it, be productive. And, uh, but there's only one tree. Don't eat from that because if you do that, all bets are off and you'll die. And the enemy comes along and he says, whispers in Eve's ear, as it were, and says, really? Surely he couldn't mean that. And Eve bought that thought, according to the story. Instead of this obedience to this thought, she bought that thought. And it says she saw the fruit of the tree was good for food. I mean, here, here's the other thing. Well, you know, why shouldn't I eat? It's good for food. It's pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. She picked one of whatever it was and ate it. And here we are. We're off to the races. Grappling, grappling with that the rest of our lives because somebody thought some way, felt something, and acted on it. Thought plus feeling equal action. So we have the scripture narratives, and I can't possibly uh, uh, speak to the whole thing about emotion. I'm just speaking to causes and roots and uh, framing, if you will. But think about what, what we would call sort of positive emotions. On, we find on one side joy and rejoicing and gratitude. This is all in the scripture. Thanksgiving, repentance, which is, which is an emotional act in a very real way because I have to think about who I am, what I've done, and act on it. And compassion. These are just a few. These aren't all. On the other side, you got anger, fear, sorrow or sadness, envy, pride, Shame, it's a big one. Contempt, you go to all of these. And sometimes they show up together. You know, you're joyful on the one hand, but you got this problem over. <laughs> Somebody sent me the picture of a t-shirt this week that said, my problem is I want to follow Jesus and slap people too. <laughs> we'll have those t-shirts on sale as you go out. I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't I don't know, I, you know. Um, I'm sorry, let me get back on track here. <laughs> you might not remember anything else but that today. I'm just putting that out there. But, but let, let's look at three big positives, if you will. Let's look at, on the positive side, what I call the positive, joy, gratitude, compassion. These are huge. Uh, joy, for example, is expressed in laughter. Lee Burke, who's a doctor at UC Irvine, medical prof for years, investigated with his team how moods affect immune systems and illness. He discovered this. They discovered this. Laughter helps fight viruses, bacteria, cancer, and heart disease. Stress does the opposite. We, anybody who's in the medical profession, you know this. You know this. 
Uh, even, I, lo I love this part, even watching one hour of a humorous video reduced stress and helped the immune system. Even the anticipation of that helped. They did this study, the anticipation. He said, three days from now, we're gonna watch a funny video. Two days before the viewing, he checked these 10 guys and they had, they had high depression, confusion, anger, all this. Two days before the video was seen, their depression was down 51%, confusion 36%, anger 19%, fatigue 15%, and tension 9%. And they hadn't even seen it yet. They were just anticipating a point of joy in their lives. He calls the influence of laughter the biology of hope. The biology of hope. I love this verse in Proverbs 17. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Way before he did this study at UC Irvine, the Bible said this. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Let's go back to the big three just for a moment. Uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, at the National Prayer Breakfast, which is an event in, here in town, I won't go into all of it, except people are invited, leaders are invited from around the world to come in the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. That's how the invitation goes out. And people from all kinds of backgrounds, you got all, I mean, all the big names, all the riffraff, whatever you want, they're, I mean, it's just, they're all there. 3,500 people from 150 nations, 700 guests from overseas, every year since 1953, and the key is to pray for the first family and leaders around the world. That's the thought. And 12 years ago, or 13 years ago, Randall Wallace, the screenwriter, movie producer, who wrote We Were Soldiers and Braveheart, that guy, he was the speaker. And uh, in one snippet, I see joy and gratitude and compassion all in, all in just a two minutes. Well, this is it. I'll let you see it. Now, I'm no philosopher, I'm not a preacher. I'm a storyteller, like Jesus. As nearly as I can tell, that's my only similarity to him. <laughs> Except for one other thing. I too have cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I've lived a life of tremendous privilege. I was. I grew up right down the road from here in Lynchburg, Virginia. Now Virginians are righteous and sober people, too proud to tell a lie. But I was born in Tennessee. <laughs> My father was born in Lizard Lick, Tennessee. The men in my father's family are Alton, Elton, Dalton, Lyman, Gleeman, Herman, Thurman, and Clyde. They, they called Clyde Pete and nobody knew why. When I was a child, I suffered from asthma. I had attacks so severe I couldn't breathe at all. And I felt that if I panicked, I would die. And my grandmother would hold me upright in her arms all night long and she would sing to me. And she would, she'd tell me stories from the Bible or from her childhood. And to me, they seemed one and the same. And she'd look into my eyes and she would smile. And, and I don't see blue eyes to this day without seeing hers. And then he couldn't speak. You go from joy to compassion to gratitude all in two minutes. There's something <clears throat> about that that shows us who we are. But life clearly is not always joyful. In Jesus' life, there was criticism, misunderstanding. There was non-understanding. There was contempt. There was sadness. And we know these experiences in bits and pieces, right? But we can know joy and gratitude and compassion. But we also know other things like sadness and fear and anger. There's a, there's a wonderful book that, that I just finished reading by Tristan and Jonathan Collins, 
Tristan is a trauma therapist. She's in Washington State, I believe, and her husband, Jonathan Collins, was one of the co-founders of a thing called The Bible Project. And they have a book entitled, Why Emotions Matter. And she talks about what we think of as negative emotions, which I call that, as signals. For example, sadness is a signal that something needs to heal. Or fear, that, that, I, that I might be in danger. Fear is a good thing, right? You want kids to be afraid of fire, you know, that, that sort of thing. Or anger, I, I know this one very well. Anger is expectations that are not met either expectations that I have of myself or that I had of you, and, you know, I didn't live up to it or you didn't, and boom, you know, I throw myself on the floor and do the tantrum thing. But he had another thought. Randall Wallace had another thought because at the cross, all of these pieces come together, as you'll see at that Easter sunrise service. But here's just one more minute from Randall Wallace. Our lives are unfolding stories. They are moving pictures. If we took a freeze frame of Golgotha on the day that Jesus was crucified and asked someone unfamiliar with the story to guess who was the victor in that scene, they'd be unlikely to say the one hanging on the cross in the middle. It was from that cross that Jesus cried, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that cry does not amaze me. What does amaze me is that while one of the thieves crucified next to Jesus mocked him, the other acknowledged the justice of his punishment and asked Jesus for help. And in the agonies of the crucifixion, Jesus was able to say, today you'll be with me in paradise. Out of the pain, out of the pain comes the promise. Can you imagine the emotions around the cross? The onlookers, right? Some are there just because it's a circus, right? The elders, the chief priests, the people who put him there, they're gloating. You got Jesus' mother who, who gave him birth 33 years ago and now she's seeing him impaled like a common criminal. You have John who's the only, apparently the only male disciple still around. You've got the women around the crowd. You have the centurion, probably a German recruit, if you will, by, by the Roman army. They think it was Hessians around the cross, who when he watches him die, he says, surely this was the son of God. But the two thieves, you got one guy cussing him and the other guy saying, I need help. And can, can you imagine the relief in this person's heart and mind? The cross is a place to see it all. So here, here's the simple truth. Positive emotions fuel health. The joy, the gratitude, the compassion, all of those. You can go read and read about negative emotions or how we respond to negative emotions fuel sickness. I mean, you know, you, you, just, um, you just think about moments in your life when negative emotions have impacted you. You know, my, my father left my mother, she was 54 years old, never worked outside the home, and uh, ended up moving to Southern California. She was in Northern California, taught herself to type back in the day and worked at a hospital for, I don't know, until she was 72, and then they came and said, Gwen, you can't work here anymore. She went to another assisted care facility, very posh across, it, and worked till she was 82. She drove a car in Southern California till she was 92. You may have seen her. Uh, <laughs> She was not the little old lady from Altadena in tennis shoes, I'll tell you. I mean, you rode with my mother. She thought she was still in India. Your, your prayer life would be improved when you <laughs> rode with my mother. <clears throat> but, but the leaving affected me. I blamed my father. I was angry. It took me eight years to be able to hug my father. Those were not my best eight years. And I was a pastor, a young pastor at the time. And... You know, the negative emotions make us sick over time. I had a radio program on CBS back in the day there in Urbana for nine years called Wake Up and Live, 10 minutes on a Saturday morning between Sports Scoreboard and Charles Osgood, that wonderful commentator who just passed away a few weeks ago. 
And uh, I would start with a secular song, because this was, this was not a church program. This was designed to bug pagans. And so we, <laughs> we, we, just, we, we just had that secular song, then I'd do a little interview, and then we'd go out with a Christian contemporary song. Interviewed a young girl from the University of Illinois, where we were, 19 years old. A few weeks later, she went with a Christian ministries group to Fort Lauderdale for spring break to talk to folks and tell them the good news about Jesus. On the way back, she was in an auto accident. She was killed. A year later, I get a phone call, and it's her parents in the Chicago area. They said, you don't know us, but we understand you knew our daughter. I'll call her Natalie. I said, yes. I said, we understand you did a little, uh, a little um, interview with her. I said, we did. She said, we were wondering if there's any chance we could get that tape because she was our only child, and we haven't heard her voice. And we haven't called earlier because the, the trauma affected us so much that both of us were disabled with rheumatoid arthritis for a whole year. We're just now coming back. But if we could get, if we could hear her voice, to just cherish that, we'd want, because trauma, negative things make us sick. So here's the point. It isn't just how I deal with emotions. It's how I deal with them in a healthy way. They're a huge part of my life. Here, here's another spectrum, and I'm, and, and I'm coming in for a landing here, okay? On the one end, this, this visual, some of us are just emotional people. And, and this little book I referenced, the wife, she said, is an emotive feeler. She's the trauma therapist. The husband, is a, he called himself a rational skeptic. So on the one side, we have folks who everything is emotional. We're just immersed in emotion with everything. On the other hand, you have oftentimes guys, not only guys, but oftentimes guys, who deny emotions or at least mistrust them, you know, and she's upset with him. Let's just use that as a model. She's upset with him because he doesn't feel, and he's upset with her because she always feels. Or what. And it, this is not the place for elbows, okay? I'm just, uh, just, <laughs> just, just, just take your hands away, back away from the person, whatever it is, okay? <laughs> on the one end, everything is connected to emotion. At the other end, it's at all costs. Don't get emotional. Here's what I want to say. To one, we say emotions are God-given, but are not designed to run your life. To the other, we say emotions are God-given, and if you learn how to express them, in, in healthy ways, your life will be richer and all those around you will be the richer for it. So how do we keep negative emotions from crippling us? Let me just show you a little video clip very quickly. There are 407,000 people in this country who are children in the foster care system and, and they're in it because oftentimes because due to neglect or abuse or inability to provide care. Some of you have been there. Some of you are foster parents or adoptive parents, and you've been there. The average before aging out, the average placements or times a child moves, oftentimes with just a little bag of clothing, is 12 to 15 if they're in the foster care system. They're all, can you imagine what that does to self-understanding and awareness and image and, and what kinds of emotions it creates? And there's a group called Finally Home, where we are, that helps, helps children with that and helps foster parents know how to support them and help them in that process. And last year I had the privilege of sitting with three kids, May and ABL and Brock, and just talked about, because they have this thing called Superheroes Academy, where they go and learn with little cartoon characters how to deal with emotions. And I just had this little conversation. It makes me laugh when I'm thinking, so I'll let you laugh and watch it, okay? I think I know that they talked about self-control, like when things go bad and I want to punch something or what. Any thoughts about, I, some of these characters deal with that, these little cartoon characters that we see. But, but when you think about controlling your feelings when things go bad, what, what can you do to help sort of control your feelings in, in situations that aren't good? Any thoughts about that? I have a hard time regulating for me, and I don't have that much self-control, but I know a lot of strategies, and it's hard for me to use them when I feel like uh, exploding, so. I like doing this thing ABL taught me, roller coaster, where you do this, 
and just it calms me down. And you breathe in when you drip. So yeah. And it out is down. And he also does rock to socks. Like Can't so you do like a little leaf. You make your hands look like rocks and you do your hardest motion and then you let it like wiggle out. I love, I love this. Can you tell me something about Finally Home Emotions Toolkit, May? Um, so in a uh, Family Home Emotions Toolkit, there's a lot of fidgets that you can use when you feel like when you're gonna explode. And um, like there's coloring books and this breathing ball that you can do. And there's, yeah, like a stuffy that you can hug with and there's bubbles and <laughs> What I like about it is mostly just how you get calm and when you're like this, it just calms you down and it just like you forget about it. You forget about your madness. Wow. Let's hear it for those kids. Uh, I love ABL. You just forget about your madness. Why don't we just take a moment? I know we're, I'm going a little bit long here, but I'm, I'm almost done, okay? Why don't we just try rock your socks? Just for a moment, just put your fist together, make it hard as you can, take a deep breath, and let it wiggle out, okay? They, anyway, that's something, don't do it while you're driving, but just that, that sort, of, <laughs> sort of thing. So, I think we just got schooled by a seven-year-old, okay? Let's just wrap this up. Here are some of these things that we've talked about are descriptions and some of them are prescriptions. Here's a prescription. Psalm 16, better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes the city. Paul says this to a young man named Timothy, for the Spirit of God does not give us, does not make us timid. timid that, that, let me try it again. For the Spirit of God the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline, self-control. So I'd like you just to walk through this with me. If it's true in, in Philippians 4 that I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, in spite of circumstances, in spite of those situations where that person is just pushing my buttons, they know how to get at me, that whole thing, right? Oftentimes I say, God... I can't control these circumstances. It's making me crazy. And he says, but I've given you the ability to control one thing, you. And I need, I need to fuel the pluses in my life and manage the minuses. That's what I need to do. So would you read these verses with me together? This is from Philippians. And Paul has gone through all kinds of stuff in his life. I don't think we can top him in the kinds of things. And this is what he says. Read it with me, if you will. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And we're going to read this part slower. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things because how you think will determine how you feel. That's how that works. Let's pray. Father, here we are again. And you're not put, put out with us. You love this when your children come to you. You love it that we not only acknowledge you, but we want to glorify you forever. Thank you, Lord, that we, we are made in your image and you made us with emotion. We are a body people full of emotion, full of uh, challenges sometimes and fears and sometimes four-masted dreams. And so we, we invite your presence. We already did this, but we're doing it again at this moment. We invite your presence as we sense how we should respond going forward in the ne next days and weeks. We give you praise for the privilege 
of being with you. And if there's anyone in the sound of my voice in this space or online who says, I, I want to know that God, I want to follow that Jesus, in this moment, just let them speak that and let them start just by acknowledgement, by thinking that, making that decision, because you will take them on the greatest adventure for which they have been designed in human history. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.